uh, actors uh, here in the EU. Today is a commemoration of the Second World War here, and uh, also tomorrow is uh, the EU Day. So we use this opportunity to launch a call to the European uh, institutions about uh, uh, the situation in uh, Pakistan. Uh, why the, this day? We chose the beginning of uh, May because uh, it is at the end of April on the 28th that um, there was a resolution uh, adopted by the European Parliament uh, focusing on the blasphemy laws and a couple of uh, Christians that had been uh, in uh, prison for seven years from uh, 2014 to 2021 uh, on the blasphemy uh, charges. And on the, that day, at the end of April, two, two years ago, that resolution was massively supported by the members of the European Parliament. Uh, only three people uh, withdrew from that uh, resolution. So it means that there is a strong support of uh, the European Parliament to see some improvements of uh, human rights uh, in uh, Pakistan. And every year since then, there has been uh, an event uh, just to remind the European Commission that uh, they should examine again and again uh, the status of uh, Pakistan, the trade uh, status. Yes, uh, last year, for example, it was uh, uh, MEP uh, <clears throat> uh, from uh, Italy, uh, Martuccello, Fulvio Martuccello, uh, that organized an event at the European Parliament, and I was invited to talk. Also, uh, <clears throat> Manel uh, was uh, present at that uh, event. Uh, also, what was done is uh, uh, a written question that was sent by Fulvio uh, Matuccello to uh, Dombrovskis, Valdas Dombrovskis, uh, and also Josep uh, Borrell. The answer of Borrell came uh, several months uh, later. Uh, also in May last year, Peter Van Dalen, uh, Carlo Fidanza, Otmar Karas and uh, <clears throat> Weimers uh, organized uh, an event that was a hearing of that uh, couple that had been sentenced uh, to death and spent uh, uh, seven years on the uh, death row. So they were heard at the European Parliament. And uh, a bit uh, later, the European uh, Commission sent a delegation to Pakistan uh, it was in the end of June of last year, and unfortunately, we are still waiting for, for their uh, report. So, uh, without further ado, I will now give the floor to Mr. Jose Luis Bazan from uh, uh, Comese, uh, where he's an advisor on migration, asylum, and international religious freedom, and he will talk about the GSP plus and the uh, blasphemy laws. The floor is yours. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, <clears throat> good morning, everyone, and thank you very much to. Uh, Human Rights Without Frontiers for organizing this event and for inviting me to take the floor on this uh, very important issue on blasphemy laws and GSP plus status of Pakistan. Uh, I will not give uh, for granted that you know what is GSP and GSP plus. I will just make a short comment on that. So the general system of preferences, GSP, is a US scheme which grants privileged access to EU markets with reduced or zero uh, customs tariffs. Its products across approximately 66% um, 66 of all EU tariff lines and to enter the EU market with zero duties in the case of GSP plus. So it's a really important um, privilege for Pakistani business. Of course, this is not for, uh, for nothing. So the country, in this case, Pakistan has to fulfill 
the international obligations uh, of 27 treaties uh, regarding four areas, including labor rights, climate, and um, also environment, good governance, human rights, including, of course, freedom of religion and human rights of religious communities and their members. We are talking about billions of euros. We are talking in the case of Pakistan exports around 5.4 billion euros, mostly textiles clothing, eh, accounting for 75% of uh, Pakistan's total exports to the EU in 2020. However, however, uh, uh, you know, one of the pillars of the GSP plus is of course human rights, whom we feel men of and to honor the obligations, including freedom of religion. And this is what is at stake currently, at least from our side that we want to comment about. On 29th of April, 21, the European Parliament adopted a resolution, quite well known, calling the European Commission and the EEAS to review immediately Pakistan's eligibility for GSP plus status in the light of the human rights abuses, including enforcement of blasphemy laws, failure to protect religious minorities from abuses of non-state actors, etc. In addition, on 16 January 2023, six UN special rapporteurs expressed alarm at the report of rising abductions, forced marriages and conversions of underage girls and young women from religious minorities in Pakistan and call for immediate efforts to curtail these practices and ensure justice for them. But we must also pay attention not only to religious freedom, but also to the violation of other human rights of religious minorities in Pakistan. Just to mention uh, the rights of parents and, 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 and students yeah, for, um, for the educational freedom. I'm gonna bring the example of the so-called new single national curriculum SNC that violates the right not to receive religious instructions against the religious beliefs of parents and those of the child. It imposes, for example, Muslim instruction in non-religious mandatory subjects like history or mathematics. As well, the evaluation system empowers the knowledge of Islam, giving extra points to them and discriminating those who are not, of course, following Islam course. Authorized school textbooks promote Islam among non-Muslim students in public schools. <clears throat> a worrying trend has been reinforced by the adoption by the Pakistan's National Assembly on the 17th of January this year to expand a law to expand the country's legislation on blasphemy, extending the punishment to those deemed to have insulted not only Muslim uh, Prophet Muhammad, but also uh, other people in the entourage, including wives, family, and companions with 10 years in prison or life imprisonment. Nevertheless, we also have to refer and to remind the Supreme Court of Pakistan um, uh, request uh, the government, in particular its police, to deal more carefully with blasphemy cases and avoid the misuse of blasphemy laws in the process last year in August 22. The extreme social and legal vulnerability of members of religious minorities in Pakistan give them no real possibility of claiming their human rights in a due process in a context where police and judicial authorities, particularly those of the lower courts, show little or no interest in prosecuting the crimes. The European Commission proposed on the 22nd of uh, September 21, a new GSP regulation, as the current one in force expires on the 31st of December this year. New international conventions will be added to the 27, that of course, um, GSP countries, including Pakistan, if finally you reply, they should fulfill an honor. We are expecting a report by the EAS and European Commission that will be sent to the College of Commissioners and addressed to the Council and Parliament. Uh, it was expected at the beginning of 23, still as far as I know, it's not, it has not been published. The new proposed GSP, GSP regulation requires as well, for the first time, the adoption by both the Parliament and the council. It means that this will not be any more, uh, let's say, a classical trade agreement. This has also a political dimension. That's very important. The, the position of the parliament is quite strong, quite clear in this regard. Once adopted, the new EU G GSP plus GSP regulation, sorry, will apply for 10 years from January, 1st January 23, 24 to uh, 34. There will not be an extension 
for the country. So the country should reapply eh? because Pakistan has to reply for getting this GSP plus status before the end of 20, uh, 2015. Just for some words for, for, uh, for the last part of my intervention as a conclusion. The situation calls for a reassessment by the European Commission and its future discussions with the Pakistani authorities on the preservation of the country's status as a beneficiary of the GSP plus status. As it is quite clear that Pakistan shows little respect for the above mentioned international obligations, in particular in relation to the country's religious minorities. In addition, some reports um, exist about how certain ruling elite in Pakistan had used this instrument for the personal gains. We should give also not only uh, attention to the legislation which is adopted by Pakistan, but most importantly, I think, is the implementation, eh? how it is put in practice, because sometimes there is a big gap between adoption and implementation. Just some specific measures that maybe could be interesting to think about. First, sometimes the judges um, know in the, the case on Blasmi law in the provinces or in the small towns, they suffer their uh, freight, they suffer harassment. And maybe it could be interesting to think about transferring all, all Blasmi law cases to court in the capital. We had the experience in Spain with the terrorist group ETA in the best country. So the judges were suffering, of course, harassment by the social entourage. And then uh, the government created one single court, Audiencia Nacional in Madrid. And all cases related to terrorism when we're going to, to the capital, to Madrid. And then you, to a certain extent, you are able to get rid of the social pressure around, above all in small towns or rural areas. The second, uh, immediate police protection of accused of blasphemy, impossible transfer to a safe place along with his family. If I'm not wrong, up to 88% of persons on trial with blasphemy cases were either killed or severely injured. So it means that there is a ma it's a matter of, of uh, real uh, physical safety. Uh, there's a last case in April of a Chinese worker who was accused of, of blasphemy. He was immediately taken by a military helicopter and put in a safe place. This is not the regular practice of the government. I'm not going to say this should be a military helicopter, but there must be ways of people getting out of potential mobs and so on. Third, criminal prosecution of false denouncer of blasphemy cases and severe punishment imposed upon them. Fourth, disciplinary measures to members of the police and law enforcement bodies and judiciary that do not protect the accused of blasphemy or mishandle the case. And to finalize, more other general measures, for example, the reform of the national single curriculum and school textbooks to include appropriate portrayal of indigenous religious minorities, including their historical presence in the land, and their contribution to the country, as well as the investigation, prosecution, and condemnation of perpetrators of crimes against members of religious minorities. And as a very particular, but I think quite effective could be also uh, the adoption of a special prosecutor of court to protect minors belonging to religious minorities, including young girls against forced marriage and enforced ban of child marriage, making their consent non-valid in case where the girl belongs to a religious minority. Thank you very much. And of course, I will be um, very open and please, if we receive any comments, suggestion from, from the audience, thank you. Thank you, Jose Luis. Uh, as I said uh, at the beginning, the European Parliament is uh, quite concerned about uh, uh, this situation in Pakistan and the GSP plus. And I would like now uh, Leo to show uh, this support of the European Parliament through a video that was sent to us by uh, Peter van Dalen. Uh, you know that today, of course, the MEPs are going to Strasbourg, so he should be on the train or uh, behind uh, or in his car. Uh, but he sent us a, a short uh, video. <clears throat> Leo? Two years ago, the European Parliament adopted a resolution on the position of the Christian couple Segufta and Safwat in Pakistan. They were on a death row because of blasphemy. And we know that so many people in Pakistan, Christian, Muslim and others, are in a death row because of blasphemy. And that's what we want to change in Pakistan. 
we have succeeded with RGBB as the beginning, but it is not enough. We should continue our battle for freedom of religion or belief in Pakistan. And the European Union has a means to put pressure on Pakistan. It is the GSP Plus program, General Specialized Preferences. We give a lot of money to Pakistan indirectly because they do not have to pay for their textile and cotton products. It is for Pakistan a very important way to get their economy in a better order. And we should use this instrument to tell Pakistan stop with blasphemy, stop by pushing people, stop by putting people in jail because of blasphemy. And that is the fight we must continue. Thank you, Peter. Even if you cannot follow us, maybe your assistant is. Um, and now I will give the floor to uh, Jonathan De Laser from a Christian Solidarity uh, Worldwide. He is a European liaison officer here in uh, Brussels, and he will address the issue of forced conversions. Floor is yours. You will have the microphone. Thank you. Um, yeah. F first of all, thank you to to Willie and to um, Human Rights Without Frontiers uh, for this invitation. Um, so CSW, we're a human rights organization specializing in uh, freedom of religion or belief uh, for all. Um, as Willie said, I've, I've been asked to cover the issue of forced conversions, which um, I'm, I'm prepared and I'm pleased to do because it, it anyway always features amongst our top uh, advocacy calls um, here in Brussels. I'm going to divide uh, this presentation into three parts. Um, the first will give an overview of the facts of what's happening in Pakistan um, in this area. Um, the second will turn to the sort of local national responses to this issue. And finally, I'll share some thoughts on, um, on the European Union's response, uh, particularly the, the new incoming GSP regulation. So um, to introduce the, itch, the issue in the country, I want to read out a few words from a letter sent in October last year uh, by seven UN special procedures, including uh, the UNSR for Forb, uh, Nazila Ghanaia. Um, in, in my reading, I'll exclude uh, the qualifying words such as allegedly and reportedly, as these are all facts which CSW can, uh, can confirm. So I quote, the practice of abducting young women and girls who belong to religious minorities and forcing them to marry and convert to Islam against their will is widespread in Pakistan, particularly impacting the Hindu and Christian minorities. Victims are taken from their cities or provinces of origin and deprived of contact with their families. They are then raped and or forcibly married and forced to convert to Islam sometimes under the threat of violence and with the direct involvement of religious clerics. These women and girls are then forced by their abductors to appear before courts and give testimony and or sign official documents which attest to their being of age and having married and converted to Islam of their own free will. This coercion takes place under the threat of violence against them or their families. Perpetrators of these offenses enjoy a significant degree of impunity enabled in part by the actions of the security forces and the justice system." End quote. I now want to share some, uh, some numbers with you. Um, this is uh, data uh, that has been compiled by one of, one of CSW's local partners uh, in Pakistan, the Center for Social Justice. Between 2021 and 2022, they documented uh, 202 incidents. I should stress this is not a, an exhaustive number. This is, um, there are various factors which, um, which impede the uh, reporting of incidents, but this is, um, I think the breakdown is helpful in giving a picture of, um, of the situation. Almost all of these took place within the Sindh and Punjab provinces. Uh, broken down by religion, the 202 cases included 120 Hindu women and girls, 80 Christians, and two Sikhs. Uh, the figures suggest that girls from quote-unquote low-caste Hindu communities are the most at-risk group. We've also seen an alarming rise over time, 
with an uptick of 59% in 2022 from 2021. It's also relevant to disaggregate this data by age. Um, of the 202 cases, only 20 were confirmed to be over 18 years old. 133 were under 18, including 55 who were confirmed under 14 years old. The rest are unknown or unconfirmed. Um, except for the, the Sindh province where the legal marriage is 18, the other provinces in Pakistan maintain a legal marriage uh, maintain legal marriage from the age of 16 under the Child Marriage Restraint Act of 1929, uh, which was brought in uh, uh, from the British colonial era. This is out of step with international law and most other countries in South Asia. There are also sometimes um, areas of judicial conflict with some Sharia interpretations, which insist that marriage is legal for girls who have reached biological puberty. So th that's some of the data. And just to briefly share a case that, um, that CSW um, has worked on, um, a Hindu woman uh, named Puja Kumari uh, was 18 years old when um, in, on March the 21st last year, uh, three men entered her home near the Chuara Mandi area of Sukho in Sindh. One of the men is said to have asked Miss Kumari to marry him. When she refused, he and the others attempted to abduct her, but after they resisted, after she resisted, they shot her. I'd now like to turn to um, some of the national uh, local responses um, to this issue in Pakistan. Um, in, in 2017, an amendment was introduced to Pakistan's penal code under section 498B uh, which sp specifically criminalized forced marriage with a non-Muslim woman, punishable, punishable by um, a fine of a million rupees and five to 10 years in prison. As far as we know, no investigations have been carried out under this provision. So while on paper, there should be sufficient legal protection for many cases, um, we're, we're just we're seeing a lack of implementation um, and, and will to enforce it. I want to give um, a few examples of where we've seen a lack of will uh, to implement, um, uh, to, and to, to enforce the law around this issue. First of all, we can point to um, public comments and speeches from leaders. One example was a, a seminar hosted earlier this year by uh, government minister Mufti Abdul Shakur. Um, here, um, individuals who were suspected of, of, suspected of having been forcibly converted were invited to share how their conversions were in fact un, unforced. While the testimonies were presumably genuine, since the event did not platform any other cases, in our, in our view it did not represent a sincere attempt by the government to engage with this issue, but rather to minimize it publicly. Secondly, we are also seeing a lack of political will in, in legislative, legislative terms or in, in parliament. While in 2019, the federal government set up a parliamentary com committee to protect minorities from forced conversions, it later failed to support and see through um, a bill on the prohibition of, um, of forced conversions, uh, which it justified for very spurious reasons. And despite the fact that minority parliamentarians were calling for it. A final example is also how um, the current government has shelved um, a reform to the Christian Marriage and Divorce Acts, um, where encouraging progress had been made under the, under the previous government. Um, the Christian community has had come together and reached um, a level of consensus on reform, um, but it was shelved, as I say, by the, by the, by the new government. Finally, I'd, I'd like to turn to um, to EU recommendations. Um, briefly, before, before I talk a bit about, um, a bit more about the, the new GSP coming, the GSP scheme coming in, which will build on what Jose Luis shared, um, I want to share just, just briefly um, two other points. Uh, first, in the area of sanctions policy, at the end of last year, we saw the UK government uh, sanction an individual, um, Abdul Haq, who was a a cleric responsible for forced conversions and marriages. 
Um, the UK did this under its global human rights uh, regime, which is equivalent to the, the EU system. And we would encourage the EU to consider um, doing the same. Secondly, just I mean, briefly touching on, um, on diplomacy. Um, I mean, we work as, as CSW, we, um, we have good contact with, um, with the EAS, um, the, the new EU special envoy on FORB, of course. Um, just one, I suppose, just one comment um, on this. For, for anyone who's been involved in um, engaging with um, Pakistan's authorities on its human rights record, one thing that will often uh, come back in these interactions is, um, is the India, India question. Uh, Pakistan will, will often uh, retort in that way. And um, some of you might be aware, I mean, the situation for religious minorities in, in India is also extremely serious. And some of you may have uh, been following the, uh, the recent violence in Manipur over, over this weekend as an example. Um, so, I mean, in our view, India deserves attention um, in terms of freedom of religion or belief um, in its own right. But I, mean, I think it's, as a byproduct of that attention, I think it may also um, help a little bit um, with the EU's diplomacy on Pakistan to be able to show that it's working uh, consistently across the region. Um, so we, we would like to see um, India also raised. Um, but the organizers are absolutely right to put the GS, GSP scheme front and center um, of, of this event. And um, just, as I say, building a little bit on what Jose Luis said, um, there is one area, especially of the new regulation, while there are promising, um, well, there are hopes for improvements um, in some areas, including monitoring and, and transparency. Um, there is one um, aspect of the new regulation, which we're very concerned about. Um, for, for those who don't know that the regulation right now is in the trilogue phase. So um, the institutions are negotiating amongst themselves uh, sort of compromises on what it will look like. And um, the council and commission's position right now um, remains that they want to add a new conditionality to the new GSP scheme, particularly in the area of migrant returns and readmissions. So they want to be able to use the GSP scheme, the new one, to leverage uh, migrant returns and readmissions. Um, CSW has commissioned a legal opinion from an international trade lawyer from the University of Amsterdam, Dr. Geraldo Hidigal, who uh, has shown how this is not compliant with WTO law. GSP schemes are, are meant to, they're allowed to have conditionalities insofar as those are relevant for sustainable development. So conditionality on human rights is, is appropriate and allowed but um, this addition of migrant returns and readmissions um, is, is not, and in, in the view of Dr. Uh, Vidigal. And what we're also concerned about is if the EU uses up its negotiating capital with Pakistan um, on migrant returns and readmissions, <laughs> there'll be less leverage available to use the GSP scheme for human rights, human rights reasons. So we're, we're very concerned um, about this, it's a very live issue. Um, the next trilogue is happening at the end of May, um, and I would encourage anyone. Uh, so, this what we're really trying to do right now is to turn the council, so the member states' position on this. Um, I would encourage anyone uh, who's interested to, to get in touch um, and and uh, work on that with us. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Donathan, for that very detailed uh, presentation that uh, you have just made. And sometimes I really wonder if the European Commission uh, or if in the EU in general, some uh, read, ever read uh, reports of NGOs, lawyers, victims uh, in uh, Pakistan, uh, when we know that there is no investigation, so no prosecution, so total impunity, which is unacceptable, which should be one of the main criteria for the EU to raise the issue of the GSP+. And now I will give the floor to Manel Selmi, um, who will talk about uh, women's rights. The floor Thank is you. yours, Manel. 
Thank you so much, Willy. I would like to thank Willy and the Human Rights Without Frontiers for the invitation and uh, for organizing this uh, conference. Uh, as you said, last, last year we, um, we participated in this conference in the European Parliament regarding uh, blasphemy laws, uh, and we are following uh, the situation regarding minorities, but also uh, mainly regarding women. So my, my, my speech would um, uh, shed the light on the situation of minorities uh, and women in Pakistan, but also in Europe. Sometimes um, uh, forced marriages are also happening in Europe and how Europe also intervenes um, uh, to help uh, these women uh, regarding uh, stopping forced marriage marriages and also uh, stopping um, um, what we call honor killings. Uh, in Pakistan, there is an increasing issue with minority religions such, such as Hindus and Christians, and campaigners claim that because forced conversions are sometimes presented in courts as a religious matter, and their attorneys claim that young girls willingly converted to Islam, the offenders avoid using the, ter the term prosecution. Every year, Pakistan receives reports of hundreds of these kinds of incidents. Most victims are from poor families and disadvantaged households. In southern Sindh province, which is home to nearly 90% of the Hindu minority group, forced con conversions of kidnapped Hindu girls into Islam and their subsequent weddings to Muslim men, usually to the abductors, are common. Hindus make about 2% of the Pakistan's estimated two, uh, 220 million people, whereas Christians make up less than 100%. Unfortunately, forcible conversions have not been made illegal in Pakistan by successive administrations in an effort to safeguard religious minorities from such actions. International reports say that Pakistani women are being forced to convert to Islam. At least 50 members of Hindu families in Sindh province are believed to have converted. And according to reports, 20 percent, uh, 27 of her women and 23 of her girls have been forcibly converted so far. On April 26, members of numerous minority communities gathered at the Lahore press club, minority group leaders said temples and mosques in the country were being burnt and people were being killed for discretion. Leaders reportedly said there had been a recent increase in such crimes, including the execution of three or four members of the minority and the vandalism of the Ahmadiyya mosque. Home to Pakistan's largest Hindu minority, Sindh is under constant social and economic pressure and faces regular conversions. The recent statement that what was presented to the United Nations Human Rights Council regarding the phenomenon of the abduction and forced religious conversion, as well as forced marriage of young girls belonging to religious minorities, particularly Christians and Hindus, has been welcomed by Christian minorities. Hindus and civil society organizations in Pakistan, they, I, I quote, express their concern over the increasing cases of forced religious conversion of young women belonging to religious minorities, end of quote, in Pakistan. A group of independent experts and special rapporteurs, including the UN Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief, called, I quote, for immediate measures to address these cases and justice for the victims, end of quote, in an appeal that was presented in UN Geneva on January 16th. For fear of powerful Islamist religious lobbies, nearly the judiciary system and the state institution are dealing fairly with this question. For instance, despite the fact that the bill prohibiting the convention of anyone under the age of 18 was passed by the Sindh Provincial Assembly in 2016, the provincial governor of Sindh has yet to sign to sign it out of concern of widespread protests. So today they are calling for equal treatment of casualties and their families. The ongoing government ought to treat it in a serious way 
the worries communicated by the global area and safeguard the weak, um, the weak people of the society or minorities especially. These cases continue to be covered by Pakistani media, hopefully, which is a very positive example of media engagement. A Hindu woman was kidnapped and raped in the Sindh province because she refused to convert to Islam. I would like to mention the documentary film, I quote, The Losing Side, which was shown at the Cannes Film Festival in France in 2022 and won an award in the category of best human rights film, which mentioned also the phenomenon of abductions and forced conversions in Sindh. Media and art as well as cinema are engaged to counter extremism and violence against women. A protest march was organized by several members of Pakistani Hindu minority to raise awareness regarding the danger of Hindu girls and women being forced to marriage and conversion. A member of Pakistani Darwar Itihad, a Hindu association stated, I, I quote, we wanted to highlight the big problem that the Sindh Hindu are facing, especially in the rural areas where young girls, some as young as 12 and 13 are abducted in daylight, forced to convert to Islam, and then marry it off to older Muslim men, end of quote. In the interior of Sindh, such cases have increased in recent months, filling the lower courts with applications from parents seeking the return of their daughters, sisters, and wives. Sadly, no delegate from the commonplace government emerged to pay attention to the supplication of, the, of these people. In 2019, the Sindh Assembly took up the issue of Hindu girls being kidnapped and forced to convert in various dis districts in the Sindh province. A goal was discussed and collectively, um, uh, and a bill was passed and changed over protests of specific legislators. However, the Assembly later rejected the bill, which made forcible religious conversions illegal in 2021. A bill that was comparable to the previous one was rejected as well. Twelve right experts, human rights experts from the United Nations voiced this, their concern in January 2023 regarding the, risk, the rising number of kidnapping, forcing conversions and marriages of girls as young as 13 in Pakistan. I would like to precise that in Islam, forced conversion and marriage are against the law. However, these practices are uh, taking place under uh, the, uh, the extremist groups. The Human Rights Commission of Pakistan's report says that approximately 1,000 girls are forced to convert to Islam each year. And Pakistan's largest minority group is made up of Hindu, a minority which is, according to the official estimates, most of Pakistan's population living in the Sindh territory and share culture, customs, and language with their Muslim counterparts. Now I would like to move to the plight of women in Pakistan, whether they are Hindus, Muslim, or Christians. As women in Pakistan keep on enduring the worst part of constrained relationship, some have additionally chosen to evade exposing such injustices. This was the case of Gaudi Kuli. In Europe and particularly in Italy, Italian prosecutors are seeking justice for Pakistani immigrant women who were allegedly killed because they refused to marry their partners, um, the partners chosen by parents, in two murder trials. The cases highlight the differences between the cultural traditions that the old generation of immigrants and uh, had and Western values of freedom and gender equality in Europe. Pakistan has additionally been confronting to the honor callings cases referring to locally as Karu Kari. Insights from the Common Freedoms Commission of Pakistan mentioned that there were 1,276 homicides somewhere in the range of 2014 and 2016. 
even though the Pakistani parliament passed a law that prohibits killings related to honor, these killings continue particularly in, ru in rural areas where many of them are not reported and go unpunished. Unfortunately, Pakistani women have been culturally treated as a second class citizen, especially when it comes to female education and job opportunities. And when it comes also to education, things look grim. The literacy rate of women is 45%, which is very low, uh, which is very high. And it is compared to men, compared to men is very low um, with uh, 69%. Despite the fact that gender inequality is a global problem, it is the root of many issues in Pakistan. It is regrettable that due to ignorance and a gender-based bi bias, Pakistani society is largely ignoring the gender imbalance and the vicious cycle of violence. I would like to conclude by this uh, idea that the situation of women and girls in Pakistan, whether they are Hindu, Christians, or Muslim, is critical. There is a need to empower young women and girls mainly with regard to education, economic opportunities, and stop violence against them mainly uh, with forced marriages and forced conversions in the case of young Hindu and Christian girls. The EU and international community, as well as women's rights and human rights activists, should act to protect young female children and stop child abuse early and forced marriages. Uh, as well as uh, violence against women and girls in rural areas. I would like to end with a quote with Malala Yousafzai saying that there are two powers in the world, one that of the sword and the other is the pen, and there is a third power stronger than both, that of women. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Selmi. Uh, really appalling situation for girls that are, as you rightly stressed, that are undereducated on purpose uh, in uh, in Pakistan. The illiter illiteracy is absolutely uh, huge, and that can explain, of course, a number of behaviors, individual but also collective behaviors of violence against uh, minority groups, uh, ethnic minorities, uh, and others. But you also clearly showed us that. Uh, so how women's and girls' rights are intertwined with uh, forced conversions, with uh, violence, uh, honor killings, uh, and so on. So this is a really a comp very complex issue for for girls, minors, uh, and uh, and women in in the country. And uh, now uh, we will give the floor. We, I was just talking about violence. I think it will be appropriate to make the link with the situation of Ahmadis that will be addressed by Marco Respinti, a journalist based uh, in uh, Italy. Marco, uh, introduce yourself and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Willy. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, let me know if this is not case, the case. Thank you, Willy. And thank you, Human Rights Without Frontier, for inviting me to address this topic today. And I also thank all the previous speakers for the, their illuminating uh, speeches. I am an, an Italian national. I'm a, I'm a journalist, um, edit, uh, director in charge of Bitter Winter, the, an online magazine in English on religious liberty and human rights. I will be talking a little bit today about the Ahmadi uh, situation in Pakistan, uh, first of all, focusing on who are the Ahmadis, very br briefly, maybe someone don't know, so will be uh, maybe useful, and then concentrating on the uh, on the scenario that they face in uh, Pakistan. And by the way, I'm not a, an Ahmadi, so I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm a, uh, I tried to study this situation and cover them as a journalist. The Ahmadiyya community is a contemporary messianic Islamic movement founded in 1889 by Mizra Gulam Ahmad, who was born in the small village of Adyan in uh, Punjab in the Indian um, part of uh, what, in what today is the Indian part of, of the Punjab region, at that time, part of British India. 
Kadyan, where Ahmad spent most of his life and is buried, remains today the holy city of Ahmadi. And Bitter Winter, which I'm honored to serve as director in charge, as I said, published a useful introduction to Ahmad theology and history and constantly updates on the situation. So if you want to refer to that uh, online magazine, um, that may be uh, useful for you. I will try to use my PowerPoint now, if I'm able. Uh, I guess you can see it. Just let me know if that is not the case. Um, can you see it? Not properly? Yeah, we see it. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, between 1880 and 1884, Ahmad wrote Bahrain i Ismadia, a work in four volumes aimed at showing the religious superiority of Islam as a response to the growing challenges and criticism by Christians and other religious groups at that time. This gained him the favor of much of the Muslim world. When in 18 1889, Ahmad claimed to have received a divine revelation. A community of followers started gathering around him. In 1891, Ahmad claimed to be both the Mazih, Messiah, the same title given to Jesus also by Muslims, and the Mahdi, or the Messiah of the latter days, expected to appear at the end of time to restore the authenticity of the true faith, meaning, of course, for them, Islam. Ismad described these teachings as aimed to provide a universal understanding of spirituality based on the Quran, which he believed could be appreciated by followers of different faiths. Thus, the Ahmadiyya community believes that Ahmad conceived the community as a revivalist movement within Islam and not as a new religion. Members of the Ahmadiyya community professed them to be fully Muslims. But the proclamation of, of of Ahmad as both Mazih and Madi prompted virtually all mainstream Muslim sects to break with Ahmadis, with clerics declaring them heretics. In fact, virtually all mainstream Muslims believe that Ahmad proclaimed himself as a prophet, thereby rejecting a fundamental tenet of Islam, literally the belief in the finality of prophethood, in Islam, Muhammad is in fact the last of the line of prophets. Of course, Ahmadi gave a totally different interpretation. I will not go into detail here, but uh, they they give, as I said, a totally different um, explanation, and they consider themselves fully Muslims. The exact number of Ahmadis in the world is uncertain due to the fact that in several countries they need to hide their religious persuasion to avoid persecution. It is estimated nonetheless that the number of Ahmadis in the world is around 10 million. Also the double of this figure, 20 million, is sometimes suggested. They are spread in 209 countries, but are mainly concentrated in India, Pakistan, Ghana, Burkina Faso, and Gambia. The country with the absolute largest Ahmadiyya population is Pakistan, with an estimated 4 million adherents. Ahmadis being considered infidels, they have been subject to persecution since the beginning of their movement. The first martyr of the community was killed in Afghanistan, Sayyad Abdul Latif, the royal advisor to the father and son kings of Afghanistan, became a follower of Ahmad in 1902, buried off underground, he was stunned to death. Nowadays, discrimination and intolerance against Ahmadis is widespread. For example, Saudi Arabia, which is an Islamist absolute monarchy, denies Ahmadis even the simple right to exist. Algeria, which is a semi-presidential Islamic republic and whose 216 constitution in Article 2 states that Islam is the religion of the state, follows a similar path. Ahmadis are jailed for the simple reason of being Ahmadis. But today, the most violent persecution of Ahmadis take place in, in Pakistan. 
In fact, while the, in most of other countries where Ahmadis are discriminated, they simply do not exist. In Pakistan, they are targeted and savagely assaulted. Their mosques are damaged and even destroyed. Their shops are sacked. Their houses are vandalized. They are attacked in the streets of Pakistani villages and beaten, and they are also killed. In February 1953, uh, uh, a revolt by a party representing political Islam, Maili e Arar e Islam, sorry for my bad Arabic pronunciation, brought to a bloodshed that it is said to have killed some 2,000 Ahmadis in Lahore, the city having become part of Pakistan after the 1947 partition of India that created Pakistan. In 1953, this party gathered a cartel of political Islamic parties which reacted against the government's religious tolerance and the appointment of an Ahmadi, Muhammad Zafurallah Khan, as Pakistan's first foreign minister. Out of these bloody riots, again, 2,000 people killed, the Pakistani government succeeded in granting Ahmadis a partial protection, even if they were still harassed and discriminated. But later, in the 1970s and 80s, both the Islamic socialist leader of the country, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, and the Muslim radical general, Muhammad Ziaullah, enacted heavy anti-Ahmadis laws that are still in force. In fact, both Bhutto and Zia were interested in making alliances with international superpowers and in establishing themselves as leaders in the Islamic world, making Ahmadis an expendable minority pay the price. Then in the 90s and the uh, years of the new century, both Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto and President Pervez Musharraf established the season of the so-called democratic persecution of Pakistani Ahmadis. As of today, the legal rationale of, for the persecution of Ahmadis, of Ahmadis sorry, in Pakistan remains the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the country passed on September the 7th, 1974, which declares that Ahmadis are not Muslims. An ordinance 20 promulgated by the government, government on April 26, 1984, that forbids references to Islam and even the use of Islamic terms and titles for the Ahmadis. Account for the years between 1984 and the year 2020 includes 26 9 Ahmadis who were killed in Pakistan, but thousands were wounded, lost their homes, their jobs, and their mosques. 86 Ahmadis were killed only in the attack against two Ahmadi mosques in Lahore on May 28, 2010. In addition, while Pakistan enacted anti terrorism. Uh, laws in, in the year 2014, these provisions, rather than protecting Ahmadis from terrorists, from terrorist attacks, were used to ban their publication and sending the police to raid their TV channel. In recent years, riots in the streets, houses set on fire, and aggressions of people have become a common feature for Ahmadis in Pakistan. The Constitution and Ordinance 20, which I mentioned, push prosecutors to spoil Ahmadis, even of the name they choose for their movement. For those Muslims who persecute Ahmadis as heretics, to use the name Ahmadis, which is one of the names of Muhammad in the Quran, uh, use this name for Ahmadis, would mean crediting them as being Muslims, which is uh, not believable for these people. For this reason, they avoided indicating them with derogatory terms like Mirzai from the name of the founders of the movement or Kadiani from the fact that Kadian is their holy city. It is a way of designating them through caricatures and parodies and means that these people are considered less than nothing were only of public humiliation. Ahmadis are even discriminated on their identity documents and in Pakistan cannot vote. In fact, in 1985, Journal Zia decided that wherever and when election would be held, citizens will be divided into 
two separate electoral lists. Muslim will elect 95% of the members of the National Assembly, and non-Muslim the remaining 5% representing religious minorities. Now, it is a tenant of Muslim believers to publicly say that they are Muslim. Failing to do it is a sin of disavowing their faith. So if Ahmadis say they are not Muslims, they violate the basic principle of their faith. But if in Pakistan, Ahmadis say they are Muslims, they violate Ordinance 20 and go to jail, or maybe worse, in the streets. Could Ahmadis simply declare, declare themselves as Muslims, hoping to go unnoticed? No, because the law requests that voters, uh, that voters show personal ID, and Pakistani ID shows whether a person is Muslim or non-Muslim. In fact, to obtain an ID certifying they are Muslims, the applicants should sign a declaration not only stating that they do not recognize any prophet after Muhammad, but that they are, they publicly regard the founder of the Ahmadis as an, quote, imposter, which is, you know, a, blas a blasphemy for Ahmadis. This is enough to give an idea I think what Ahmadis suffer. I just want to recall two recent crimes. On February in the 19th, this year, at 75 years old Ahmadi Muslim, Dr. Rashid Ahmad, well known in the area for his humanitarian service to the most neglected villagers, was brutally shot dead in Guteriala, a village in the Gujarat district in Pakistan's Punjab province. The victim was hit by several shots in the health center where he works, the Dr. Rashid Jad Clinic, a homeopathy clinic that he established to serve the poorest villages. The tragedy, this tragedy, is an international incident that all international agencies and bodies should note because and goes beyond Pakistan borders, even if it took place in Pakistan. In fact, Dr. Ahmad was born in Pakistan, but he has ago became a Norwegian citizen. In this new hate crime, a foreign citizen was murdered in Pakistan because of, because of his faith. And to my knowledge, there is uh, up to this day, apart from a few articles by Ahmadis and by some international journalists, there is no reaction. There is no, no response to this international crime. The second, on March the 3rd this year, Jahid Azan, a young man reportedly around 25 years of age, was beaten to death in northern Bangladesh. Yes, this letter, the letter of these crimes happened in Bangladesh, but it underlines that the way that, uh, the way that, um, is, uh, that Ahmadis are treated in Pakistan is going beyond the border of Pakistan and people are imitating the, the treatment that, that, that some Pakistani Muslims uh, uh, reserve for Ahmadis uh, also in their country. And this is too bad when it becomes contagious and it's very bad. Of course, people have the right to disagree on a theological level. They always have this right, which is part of each person and group's right to religious liberty. Muslim clerics and theologians had the right to discuss Ahmadi beliefs and even to criticize them. It is part of mainstream Muslims' right to religious liberty. Of course, also non-Muslim enjoy that same right to criticism. It may even fall under a believer's religious duty to do so, be him or her Muslim or not. At the same time, Ahmadis have the right to the same critic of others. What no one has, Muslim or not, Ahmadi or not, is the right to violence and to deny others their own right to truth, which is the true meaning of religious liberty. Every human being and group has the right to believe that, that truth exists and to follow it. Theological debates contribute to a better understanding of one's own right to truth, but violence is always wrong. If a person is guilty of a crime, it should be prosecuted by just law, whatever his or her religious belief may be. 
religion and treat should never be transformed into accusations. And Ahmadis, like all other human beings, should let be free in their treat. I think that the international community needs to do all that is in its power to secure this. And it's, I'm very happy that this um, topic is addressed from the prestigious press club in Brussels on a day like today, um, and that someone in, at the international level may um, listen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. Uh, and also because uh, you showed us that uh, the persecution of Ahmadi is uh, rooted in the history of uh, the region. But what is worse, that it has been legalized and that there is an encouragement, an incitement to hatred going as far as violence and the killing of Ahmadis. So I wonder how the EU can tolerate uh, that such a country applies such uh, policies and shouldn't uh, draw some conclusions in terms of its uh, commercial trade uh, relations with uh, Pakistan. In connection with the, the issue of Ahmadis, uh, I will now give the floor to the next uh, speaker that is uh, also online. Akmal Bhatti is uh, in, based in Pakistan. He's a lawyer, okay. Uh, lawyer, chairman of Minorities Alliance in Pakistan. Welcome uh, to here in our discussion in Brussels at the Press Club, and I'm very happy that uh, you could uh, join us despite the time difference, uh, which is, well, worse if, of course, you are based in the United States, uh, as it is the case of one of our last uh, speaker. So uh, could you tell us about, from your experience uh, in Pakistan as a lawyer, uh, what is the situation of religious uh, minorities? Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, okay. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Willie and uh, your organization, Human Rights Without Frontiers, that you invited me. Uh, now, I would love to uh, tell all the participants about the situation, especially about the hate, hate crimes that are uh, usually committed against the religious minorities of Pakistan. Pakistan is facing unprecedented escalation in hate speeches that is creating a climate of fear among minorities and increase in violent religious extremism. Perpetrators of hate speech act without impunity, while those who de defend minority rights also become target of hate and intimidation. Hate has become a key contributing factor in the crimes committed against religious minorities, and yet it is frequently met with the lack, lack of accountability. Hate reinforce and exacerbate long-standing marginalization and exclusion. Prosecution of religious minorities including Shia, especially Hazara community, Ahmadiyyas, Hindu Sikh, Kalash community, boost the sad, sad record of being the only state-sponsored politics of bigotry. Pakistani culture of impunity along with state in action is suffering the rise of hate crimes and blasphemy acquisitions. According to the Minorities Alliance Pakistan, my organization, 103 accused of blasphemy killed in which 89 men, 14 women since 1947. Extremist group wields immense influence in Pakistani society. Last night, an innocent person was killed by a charge mob in Mardan district. I have shocked to see the footage of that incident. In such matters, the sense scenes of fear is so profound that anybody can't dare to ask those who accuse anyone of blasphemy. This element of fear 
encourage extremists in their lynching and hate campaign. I witness an immense popularity of TLP, Tariqe Labbe Pakistan, during last decades that far right group fiercely oppose any change to these sensitive religious law. From violent attack to social exclusion and harassment, minorities are facing discrimination daily. Victimization particularly add layers of jeopardy for minorities, women and girls. This range from social exclusion and stigmatization to violation, including abduction, statutory rape, grooming, forced conversion, and underage marriages. Doubly marginalized by gender and minority status, the majority of our movement works in sectors like sanitation, agriculture, in brick cleans, or as domestic workers. Hate is Hate in schools and colleges textbook being published play vital role in hate crimes. One of the immediate effect of hate speech is that people experience a loss of self-esteem. Minority students mostly lose interest in studies. Our working class have observed, experience the same phenomena at their workplaces. Our innocent people incarcerated since decades, what kind of inexpensive and expedi expeditious justice promised by the constitution. Police and prosecution departments do partial and defective in investigation in the cases of blasphemy and forced conversion. We are facing hate and discrimination constitutionally and institutionally. The Constitution of Pakistan 1973 says that state shall protect the legit legitimate interest and right of the minorities. I asked to those legislatures, can we classify rights into legitimate or illegitimate? Being a Christian, I am barred to be elected as the president and prime minister of the country. As a lawyer, I am barred to present my peoples in federal Sharia court. What type of equality of citizenship and equal status are given to me and my people? In, in institutions, my people are mostly preferred to do the job of sanitation and sweepers. They are forced to dig the sewer lines without the safety kits, equipment, and gas masks. They, these people's responsible departments playing with the life of my peoples without providing the social security and health insurance. If someone dies during, during his job, families are neglected and victims struggle to get compensation. I am observing, it's very important, I am observing since six to seven years that hate agencies, fanatics, and right wings and religious clerics are injecting venom in society every year on the occasion of celebration of the birthday of Prophet Muhammad. People, especially seminary students, organize public rallies. Mostly they chant the slogan that blasphemers have only one punishment, that is beheading. Young fellow and kids, every day, chant this slogan in streets and markets, but nobody is taking the notice. Yesterday, we commemorate Catholic Bishop John Joseph's on the 25th martyrdom anniversary. He sacrificed his life in 1998 in front of the main gate of the session court Sahiwal. This court sentenced death penalty to Ayub Masi, accused of blasphemy. Bishop John was my village fellow. My predecessor, my uncle, Shabazz Bhattis, was gunned down in March 2nd, 2011, fighting against these draconian laws. We are facing challenges while struggling against blasphemy law. But believe me, we are committed with our cause. I will not keep silent against brutalities and atrocities. I will not keep silent against victimization, persecution of my people. I will not get silent against forced conversion of minor girls 
and mis misuse of blasphemy law. I appeal to all of you for prayers and support, and I urge to all of you that stand with us against these discriminatory law. I must end with the holy verse from Holy Bible, the book of Matthew chapter 10. And you will be hated by all from my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Akmal, for sharing your, your views on these very serious issues in Pakistan. And uh, we see that education is certainly one of the problems in, uh, in Pakistan. Education and uh, uh, lack of it, uh, I should say, is certainly one of the reasons why there is so much uh, violence uh, in, the, in the country. I recently read a book by Jacques Attali in France, 400 pages, uh, having a review of the uh, level of education or lack of it worldwide. Uh, and about Pakistan, it was saying it is the second country after Nigeria to have the highest unschooled population. And when you see Pakistan and Nigeria, the level of violence, I think that the lack of education, the lack of proper education is certainly one of the reasons of uh, so much violence, so many kidnappings, uh, killings in, in both uh, countries. And such a situation could be corrected with proper, proper uh, education. But the content of the school books in uh, Pakistan is really problematic and it even encourages uh, hate speech and violence against uh, minorities. That's something that we should keep in mind, that education, promoting good education is uh, something that uh, uh, is extremely important. And unfortunately, this is not the case in Pakistan when I, if I focus on the words proper uh, education. Uh, when you know it is from the book of Jacques Attali, that one third of the, the boys and girls, well, the children do not complete the first, primary, first uh, five primary uh, classes and that the, the, the two third remaining among them only 50% can read after five years in the primary schools. And there are only 600 people reaching the 600% sorry, uh, reaching the, the, the universities. I think we should have some reflections about, uh, um, about education and school books uh, in, uh, in Pakistan. Now I will give the floor to um, Tabassum Yousaf, uh, who is a high court lawyer, and uh, she will uh, share with us her experience concerning forced marriage of uh, minor girls, but uh, uh, also some cases that she, hand, she has defended, and uh, cases where she really uh, rescued girls from an awful, uh, an awful end. Welcome here in Brussels uh, <laughs> through the Zoom uh, connection. Thank you so much. Uh, for... Yes, please. Uh, thank you so much for uh, Willy for your, this opportunity to speak to me about the situation of uh, my, minority girls in uh, Brussels and the. Uh, what are the situation it's we can say as we uh, others had say that we have lack of education is the first root cause of the uh, and as you said that there is a no proper education of uh, there is a lack of education the no proper system of education in pakistan so that's the problem that our uh, girls even even the families did not know what is their uh, fundamental rights in the constitution of 1973 of the Pakistan. So uh, it is the first of the root cause. If uh, they have did not uh, proper education or the basic education, the primary or the school education, and afterwards there is need of the time that we give a proper education of fundamental rights to all uh, minorities, 
to through the churches, through the parishes, through the local government, or uh, through every person, they must know in case of any uh, rigorous uh, or grievance, what they and where they can go to get the help to the police or to the because. As we see, there are minor girls who are suffering of the course conversion or sexual abuse in any kind. And they have the, the firstly, they did not have the uh, uh, woman counter in the police station. But now it is a good step that every police station have a woman counter. But as we know, there is no proper uh, system uh, in Pakistan. The police and the judiciary is not. Um, taking too much or to the mark as they have to do. As we see that there is the Sin Child Marriage Disdain Act in Sind in 2013, uh, which is implemented, but there is, uh, n it is written in the uh, law that every child, child mean a person male or female who is under the 18 years of age, whether he's a male or a female. And child marriage is a marriage to either party contracting a party is a child. But situation is this, when the matter came to the court, as we see, uh, firstly, most of our people, majority from, as I deal with the case um, from Christian uh, community, uh, as we see, most of the families did not have the proper documentation of their children uh, ab about their birth, uh, birth certificates and the date of birth. So when they come to the uh, matter of the situation that they do not have the proper date of birth of official record, of, uh, so they do not uh, can continuously delaying tactics of the uh, procedure that court also and police also, the prosecution also taking delays and continuously delays means a lot for uh, for the justice as uh, for me being as an advocate of high court in uh, karachi pakistan uh, justice delay is justice denied uh, because as we see in the case of the meetup uh, last year in uh, february she has been rescued uh, by um, the through the help of church in need italy aid to the church in need italy because uh, being as a volunteer of a lawyer, I have been helping that. But the as you see the as you also read the uh, father Mani, uh, who is the rector of the uh, National Commission of Justice and Peace in Lahore, his in interview he said that uh, the system to get justice and recover the minor through court is very uh, exhausted and very expensive because uh, they uh, did not get justice through the court most of the time. Uh, one of the reasons is that happened mainly in the Christian or Hindu, uh, uh, when they come to the uh, Muslim extremist group, they put pressure on the families and the girls. Uh, and without going to the court, it is impossible to get the minor through release from the hand of the radical Muslims kidnappers, but going to the law consume a lot of the time and money, even most of the lawyers and afraid and deal with the such cases. And somehow many of the judges are afraid to take these cases in his or her court. As in uh, my uh, cases, uh, there is a female judge, I did not mention her name. Uh, she is continuously uh, refusing that, uh, madam, uh, this is uh, why did not they let her daughter to be uh, in the marriage because now she is converted now she is married please let her go that he she she is married to a muslim man so why why they do not let her go so this is the this is the phenomena of the judiciary this is the phenom uh, when i am talking to uh, my uh, colleague she is in a prosecution and when i said that there is a law that since Child Marriage Restrain Act 2013, uh, she simply uh, said that, yes, there is a law, but there is no implementation and you never get the girl back because there is no implementation. You did not get the justice because in Holy Quran says, uh, when uh, 
she has been uttered the kalma and she is uh, now she is muslim so not easy to get the girl back but uh, through the help of church in need uh, acn it is uh, that we get the girl back but as we see uh, uh, according to the united nation human rights council in uh, uh, submit a report on 2022 there are at least 78 documented cases of the abduction and forced conversion of islam and forced marriage of young women in pakistan in 2021 and this, uh, there is also um, when i uh, when i discuss the name of my one uh, girl name is mirab she has been also rescued by uh, from karachi court that she is also a Twelve year minor Christian girl. She is also a victim of forced marriage and forced conversion. And now, when we uh, firstly they did not, we did not get the girl. We did not through the police and the prosecution. We uh, also uh, other sources. We get the girl from the other other cities of the Karachi, and we get back to the girl to the court before the uh, honorable court. the judge said to said that i am i i want to meet that girl is my voice is clear uh, so yes sorry okay okay thank you okay uh, um, so the situation is uh, going worse and worse because uh, that Uh, just said that i met the girls in my chamber and asked her what she wants uh, for my consent and the parents are also in the present in the court and he uh, continuously uh, said to her are you christian or a muslim uh, when she was in, uh, in the court the priest she was bring to the court through police in the police custody and she Uh, tells her parents that if she did not said that i am not a christian i am a muslim they will kill me and also my parents and my brothers and sister so i have definitely tell them that i am not a christian i am a muslim girl now because i utter a kalma and i am muslim girl and continuously a judge uh, is uh, uh, facilitating and uh, guiding that that if someone even your parents who are the natural guardian guardian of the daughter said that if they didn't said single thing or something just let me know me as your uncle the police as your uncle come and rescue you how could it possible that uh, parents did not have the right to meet the girl and they did not have the right to uh, uh, rescue the girl uh, but unfortunately we also see that in um, uh, one second uh, in lahore high court there is a, a case of a pumi muskan that lahore high court pass a judgment that she is a minor and she go back to her parents uh, uh, with with her mother but unfortunately as we see in the karachi or other uh, provinces of uh, pakistan especially in punjab there is very difficult to get the minors from back from the clutches of the abductor and the other extremist groups because they see they said that she or he uh, she is uh, now a muslim girl even in the high court of uh, karachi pakistan i also see that now the judge uh, uh, said that a now she is not a um, christian girl so how can you say that under the christian marriage and divorce act she is a christian and how the christian law of uh, uh, christian marriage and christian law be applicable to her now she utter a kalma and she is a muslim daughter she attained the age of puberty so she can now be a muslim so under the muslim law she can marry uh, when she attained the age of puberty so it is very difficult when uh, to get the justice from the judiciary 
there is uh, one complication as well as i said that there is a first problem is the root cause is that lack of education as you said there is a proper uh, no proper education there is uh, many lacunas in the law as we see there is a, a sin child marriage restrain act 2013 in uh, sin province only in the sin province uh, but there is a one lacuna in it that there no single section which says that marriage we under uh, uh, under the uh, under child marriage it is a uh, valid or illegal because it is uh, when marriage solemnized there is no way under the sin child marriage act that marriage is ended when it is a uh, void marriage but as we see uh, because uh, when we see that there is a lacuna in also that there is a uh, child marriage restraint act 1929 in whole the country of pakistan but unfortunately it was not implicated and as we see there is a one lacuna as well the same day when she was abducted and the same day of the conversion certificate is also issued how could it say that the same days when she is abducted and same day of conversion is done and the law should be uh, for the conversion of any religion should be passed in stop in in order to stop the forced conversion we should uh, as being as an uh, european union and as gsp status to the pakistan it is very necessary we emphasize as inter international community emphasize on the pakistan that there should be a uh, proper law for the conversion of any uh, person who can should be passed and for my, being as a uh, being as a pakistani i went to also suggest that there is few extremist elements who are uh, emphasize on the forced conversion of minor there are proper mindset or the few elements who are continuously implementation and practicing this kind of forced conversion and forced marriages of minor girls from hindu hindus and christian uh, community but there is also lack of knowledge from my uh, muslim muslim community as well as we see that there is a, a doctrine of saint catherine which was signed by holy prophet uh, hazrat muhammad uh, peace be upon him he said also that under that law it is a charter of uh, right without any duties to the uh, christian uh, that under that law uh, that right to property freedom of religion freedom of work and security of the person also uh, uh, safeguarded by the holy prophet and it, it is um, must be obeyed by all the muslim because holy prophet said that uh, hazrat muhammad said that you must obey it until the day of judgment all the muslim person who is is a muslim should obey that law but unfortunately it is not in the our courses it is not in a single uh, national curriculum it is not taught in the religious uh, teachings it is not taught in every in in single preaching of a mosque or anywhere but as we see the sin child marriage is in act uh, one thing emphasizes on that under section 8 of the sin child marriage is in act it says that uh, we can uh, it is a cognizable it is non bailable and uh, punishable under the uh, this law but also uh, punishment is for only 3 years or minimum 2 year and fine when we see that the girls who have been rescued by me uh, are 10 girls from uh, karachi pakistan they are uh, only fine for 50000 pakistani rupees just to commit that offense they only uh, 50000 pakistani rupees they have get fine for the ruin the life of the minor uh, who has already been raped and mentally tortured and physically tortured psychologically tortured only 50000 is enough uh, to get that uh, bail and also uh, as we see the uh, 
i can uh, quote uh, one article from the dawn news uh, that uh, a muslim doctor dr ali asghar dasti uh, said that single national curriculum divided people into us and you the us group the us group is a superior and the you group is inferior as thus you look down upon us he said the constitution of pakistan itself is a discriminate, discriminatory as non muslim cannot be headed the state with the national curriculum single national curriculum um, now what kind of value are you passing on to the impassionate minds uh, it is the dr ali asghar he is a muslim uh, professor in U federal university of urdu in karachi Uh, it is also published in the dawn news on 8th may of 2023 but as we see that there are the conclusions could you come to the conclusions yes one conclusion is that we are overloaded with the laws uh, when we become a sign signatory of any treaty we also in hurry and we uh, make some amendments and the correction but we did not uh, follow the there must be a proper scrutiny from the european union also for the check and balance what's rights on going on and what are the problem there is uh, there is no implementation there is no rule of law we are over in pakistan we are overloaded with the laws but there is no rule of law there is no implementation of law that is my point thank you very much for your message to the european union and for sharing with us your direct experience uh, as a lawyer with uh, with court cases thank, thank you very much <laughs> and i will now give the floor to well a uh, last minute uh, uh, speaker i would say um, <clears throat> when distributing uh, the, the the program uh, through our newsletter someone uh, from the us from the new york uh, Uh, contacted me and said well i am the brother of nadim samson a christian arrested and detained on blasphemy charges uh, he was released uh, on bail in january 2022 after several years uh, in prison uh, i think he was uh, arrested in uh, 2017 but the charges uh, the blasphemy uh, charges uh, remain So welcome to our conference here in uh, Brussels Mr Rafael Shakil and uh, I will give you the floor now to explain trying to explain us let's say in five minutes about five minutes uh, what is the message that you want to send to to, to Brussels about your brother in particular Oh uh, good morning sir uh, 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 can you hear me clearly Yes yes okay. yeah yeah thank you so thank you so much uh, human rights uh, without frontiers mr willy and whole team uh, uh, brussels uh, uh, media press club and all the team members here uh, you gave me opportunity to speak here uh, and invited me as a uh, brother of uh, blasphemy victim uh, nadim samson and uh, uh, i would like to introduce myself uh, as a uh president for non profit here in uh, uh, united states uh, american defenders for persecuted human and uh, i have two parts of my presentation i would like to uh, finish a uh, few minutes so uh, first part as uh, as a uh, family member of uh, blasphemy victim nadim samson so uh, on november 24th 2017 uh, false blasphemy section uh, 295c which is a death penalty case was lodged on property contention based in shahdar lahore pakistan against nadim samson uh, uh, as a, he, he is a catholic uh, christian and local police and muslims mob attacked his house and burned all his belongings out in the street uh, nadim uh, transferred to lahore district jail after brutal physical torture by the police and forced confession of the crime which he never committed and after 4 years uh, he got released uh, with the bail orders issued by the supreme court of pakistan so uh, uh, after 4 years so the the thing is 
uh, I'm, I'm really thankful to the uh, Catholic Church, uh, Lahore Diocese in Pakistan, who provided the uh, legal help for my brother and political and diplomatic pressure uh, by the State Department, United States, and USERF, uh, United States Commission of International Religious Freedom, uh, collectively. And thank you so much, HR, uh, HRWF, because you published the articles. And that was the same day, uh, December 3rd, uh, 2021, when the um, uh, incident of uh, uh, Priyanta Kumara, uh, body was uh, uh, burned into the streets and uh, that lynching incident was happened that was the same day and uh, as a biological brother this is testimony that false blasphemy charges on my brother not affected only to my brother's life but also all family members uh, psychologically uh, economically and financially so i urge uh, this is the uh, current situation of uh, my brother that he's uh, uh, still, he's in safe house provided uh, by the family. And uh, this is his uh, picture. This is his uh, wounded, uh, injured leg. This is short, tortured by the police. And he's uh, uh, still uh, under treatment. And uh, Nadeem Samson is expecting the help from uh, European Union parliamentarians. Uh, for his safe evacuation as the evacuation made uh, possible uh, for was uh, possible for the uh, Shagofta Kosar and her husband in 2021 uh, by Mr. Peter Wandelan and, and his uh, friends. So secondly, as a president of uh, a nonprofit American Defenders for Persecuted Human, I would like to state uh, uh, something about the state of Pakistan, uh, what's happening uh, there. So I would clarify that uh, uh, in Pakistan, we have 34 federal ministries. Uh, uh, the religious, free, uh, religious affairs is one of them, religious affairs, and the human rights is the other one, human rights ministry. But the, uh, the thing is, uh, they're, they're, uh, the religious fair ministry has a lot of uh, agency functions, ministry functions, and one of them is, uh, a national minority commission, but uh, unfortunately, uh, that is inactive and uh, failed to raise a uh, voice against blasphemy laws and speechless against atrocities and aggression of Muslim majority towards all the minorities, including Christians, Ahmadis, and Shia sects. And I would like to clarify also that they have. Uh, 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 one uh, uh, activity, so that is called interfaith harmony. So, uh, but the thing is, that is uh, that is just uh, uh, cake cutting ceremonies. Uh, they 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 promote interfaith harmony with the church and that other, all other religions to promote peace and harmony. Yes, all the religions they give message for peace and harmony, but there is uh, nobody uh, raises voice for the uh, religious freedom. Like in United States, uh, we have. Uh, uh, IRF, United States Commission of International Religious Freedom, but there is no uh, concept of IRF in Pakistan and uh, uh, nobody uh, uh, talk on the IRF. And that's my uh, cause today that uh, uh, first thing, uh, all international civil societies may be stepped forward for the, uh, for the evacuation of my brother, Nadim Samson and all other uh, 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 pr prisoners, prisoners of conscience who, ha who, are, who have released uh, on bail are, are the other way. So uh, there is Nadim Samson, then there is Patras Masi, then there is Savan Masi, Stephen Masi. These are all uh, prisoners of conscience. They are well-known cases. So they release some somewhere, but they are still there. So they cannot survive in Pakistan and uh, they are still waiting for their evacuation. Sharing your testimony with all of us and stay online. There might be some questions uh, <clears throat> to be addressed uh, to you uh, because now we are going to uh, open the last part of uh, this conference, the, the Q&A, the question and answers, but also comments are welcome if they are short. <laughs> so uh, first question, 
Yes, madam. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, uh, seminar workshop. I am. Uh, I have studied physics and informatics, and I am a member of the European Physics Society. And I have a very short question. Um, Can you say to whom it will be addressed? Uh, to all the people who can answer, I don't prefer nobody, so I am in no preference. Uh, my question is, uh, it is a culture of impunity in Pakistan, on no respect of law. Why, when in European Parliament don't condemn this officially? I never heard the condemnation from the European Parliament against Pakistan. Why uh, European Commission don't uh, make, don't relate any accord with Pakistan to respect of human rights and especially uh, uh, women rights and minority rights. It must be related. You, we make this accord e only and only if you make good step in respect the human rights. That, that is very clearly, I did. You, we have Magnitsky law. Magnitsky law, we can use it against people who don't respect the human rights, very clearly. They are the um, um, a group in European, uh, in the uh, political group who want to bring Magnitsky law uh, on European level. This is the first question. Okay, the let's, second, fir let, let's first answer the first question. <laughs> Uh, who wants to comment? <laughs> yeah, I can, if you want. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's quite simple. I, I had the same question. <laughs> My answer is I had the same question. Uh, and I tend to suspect that sometimes the EU is very shy with some countries, violent countries, not respecting the rule of law and human rights like Pakistan, because these, these countries like Pakistan may have some uh, nearby friends and uh, allies who intimidates, uh, so to speak, uh, even the EU uh, and in the area where where Pakistan is, is located, we have, for example, China, which is a champion in not respecting religious liberty and human rights. And we know for sure that, that sometimes China uses um, Pakistan to, uh, to wage violence even beyond the border of Pakistan itself. Um, that is not a complete answer, but may help in understanding that relationship. I mean, we, we have a clear vision and a clear mind, I think, I dare to, to say on human rights and religious liberty, but international organization may, um, may reason differently. I'm not saying they're right, but they, uh, they, they reason differently. So what is important for us, for example, human rights, religious liberty, respect of rule of law, respect of uh, humanity uh, is not taken in the same way by some of the most important international um, bodies. Yeah, thank you, Matko. Well, I'm not going to give you an answer. I'm just going to give a comment because, of course, we are dealing with the trialogue, the European Commission, Parliament, and of course the Council, and the position is different. So the Parliament is obviously highly political. That's why it probably will be a different perspective this time. It's not a regular, let's say, a negotiations or trade agreement with Latin America or the United States or whoever. You know? So I think that's the that's first point. The second point is that, <clears throat> of course, now probably there will be a more, um, if I may repeat the expression, more for more approach with Pakistan. So the question is, I mean, as uh, if you fulfill more, I will give you more. I think it's a progressive understanding. It's not, uh, it is a black and white, but more, it will be like that probably. Yeah. Concerning the issue of, um, let's say, generally speaking, human rights or women's rights, children's rights, and, and so on, 
uh, I think that, of course, there's another instrument, which is the human rights dialogue, which is dialogue. Sometimes you put on the table something, and of course, the other just either smile or just say, well, we take note, or maybe say, well, we have our problems as you have your problems. And we have also problems, and, and we have seen that with China and others. Eh? We cannot be either naive, nor arrogant, nor patronizing others or being paternalistic. We can put on the table what is in Pakistan, in India, in China, or whatever. But at the same time, we have to approach, in my understanding, a way of uh, not helping or assisting, because it seems to be that you are at the top and you're having another one which is like uh, disabled. But I would say that we have to be fair also to others and to be honest in the sense of offering uh, concrete proposals. For example, I was just a minor proposal. Maybe why don't you transfer plasma cases to, 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 to the capital? It's a very small one. You're not trying just to, let's say, hijack the whole policies. We are aware of that. But I'm, I'm, I'm just commenting that in terms of progressing. If we give big words, probably we'll receive big emptiness. If we go uh, uh, step by step with concrete proposals that we know that is the right one, for example, why don't introduce a historical understanding of the minorities who were already before Islam arrived on that land? St. Thomas was there <laughs> before. You know, uh, not only that, but it gives the idea that these Christians here are not foreigners, are not alien. They belong to the land even before Islam was there even though Islam has been dead for centuries. So I think that we have maybe sometimes to make small realistic. I think that when it comes to the parliament, we can talk about what is ideal. When it comes to the council, then you go to the reality of the counterpart. You know, I think that's, it's not an answer, but just a way uh, to move forward a little bit about this discussion that one will shield in his understanding, the others will call, but the door will be closed. I think that we have to little, little pave the way for a different understanding. No, just just to um, support what Jose Luis just said about um, thinking strategically about um, how we speak, right? Um, there's obviously a domestic political uh, change that needs to happen. And I think there are strategic ways of helping that. I mean, <coughs> another example, I mean, in, in my remarks, I mentioned um, that the Child Marriage Restraint Act was, was brought in by the British colonial era. Um, it's the same for, for blasphemy laws. Um, if these can be articulated and explained in that way of, these are, these are foreign laws that have happened, you know, during the colonial era, um, then the progressive cause can be uh, sort of politically winnable in Pakistan as well. So it's being clever about how we how we promote these things as well. Yeah, uh, indeed, those laws dated back to uh, to the British uh, colonial period. Yes, I, I wanted to point out that um, uh, with regard to the European Parliament, there were uh, several resolution, and this is what happened with uh, Shafkat Ibanuel uh, specific cases. So I think that uh, with regard uh, to the European Parliament and certain groups, they they uh, I mean they made um, uh, a huge impact regarding this resolution. But of course, it's very complicated. It, there is also um, uh, an international context: the fight against terrorism, what is happening in Afghanistan, um, uh, also Pakistan um, is trying to, to make uh, efforts. So what the EU is trying to, to, to do is also uh, implementing a kind of dialogue also uh, to fight against extremism and, and uh, violent extremism in the region, mainly with, with Afghanistan. Uh, but also um, what is happening is always when you speak to a country, they always say, OK, why, why me? Why don't you speak to India or to China? or to that and that. So this is the problem. The problem is to implement a dialogue and saying that these measures are not against you. It's just to protect a certain minority and we need you to protect this minority. Of course, we understand that the religious and the social context is very complex in Pakistan. And that's why we need to work together to, to stop a violent extremism. We need to work together for education, for peace, for, in for religious dialogue. And this is very, very uh, difficult and very complex, but at least we need to try to uh, implement this kind of strategies. Of course, uh, as, as, uh, as, you, as you said, 
at the very beginning, we need to use strategies, but after that, step by step, we move to, to certain, let's say, restrictions or, or, uh, uh, or sanctions, economic sanctions, which can wor work. But of course, uh, uh, at the very beginning, we need to, uh, to, to implement this strategy of diplomacy. Uh, but I, I know that this is very problematic for these people who are suffering there, who are tortured and who are kidnapped. And uh, unfortunately, this is a very, uh, um, uh, let's say, critical case. And it's a human rights issue. And we should all work together to, to uh, I mean, to save these people from uh, from uh, uh, kidnapping and and, and mainly uh, uh, girls, minor girls. So uh, I, I believe that uh, the EU can give a very good example regarding uh, women's rights, regarding education. But they need to work together. We all need to work together to to um, um, fight against violent extremism, to implement peace and for religious dialogue. Thank you. Uh, can I? Oh, yeah. Introduce yourself. Thank you very much, Mr. Willy. Uh, myself, Jamil Maksud. We know each other from a long time. I hail from Pakistani occupied region of Jammu and Kashmir. So thank you very much for holding this uh, very important uh, conference today on blasphemy laws in Pakistan and bringing uh, various uh, political, social, economical, and legal perspectives to the audience. What we have learned from today's uh, speeches and notions that all about is rule of law that is missing in context of Pakistan. Uh, whereas uh, its uh, willingness is concerned, Pakistan is, uh, is a state party in UDHR and International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, as well as a member of United Nations Human Rights Council. But, uh, uh, so far as the protection of uh, religious minorities is, is concerned, uh, Pakistan has failed to comply with its international obligations. So what we should do now as uh, human rights defenders together uh, with HR, Human Rights Without Frontiers and many others who are on the, on the podium today, uh, we should write uh, a, a comprehensive letter to the European Commission, Human Rights Department, and also uh, to the uh, UN Peace Building and Human Rights Department, as well as other international organizations, so that we can work together to pressurize government of Pakistan to comply with their international obligations in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Another question there. Yeah. Um, my name is uh, Lonatia. I'm a lawyer here in Belgium. I was born in Belgium and uh, my parents are from uh, Pakistan. I'm sorry for my English because I'm a French speaker. I never spoke in English, but I have just a comment uh, to make about uh, what we have talked uh, about today. As uh, everybody know, the evolution of the countries in um, the Orient, um, regard to the country of Occident, Occident here, Europe, etc., it's um, very slow. So uh, when we are today, the Orient country are going to be in 50 years or 60 years. The, the, the evolution is very slow, but I think that uh, we can't deny that there is a, uh, nothing that the Pakistan um, government, it's... Uh, um, it, there is some uh, concrete uh, law, etc., that have been taken. But uh, as was saying the advocate, the problem it's the um, education. I think that um, it's a point uh, in which uh, all common uh, or country must work, and it's um, this um, this. Uh, uh, intention of uh, work together, it's the better way uh, to have concrete result. It's not with, uh, I think, uh, as we say, the, uh, say openly uh, any negative things that we can work for something good. I think that if the country is trying, we, we must encourage and uh, must uh, propo sorry, propose and, uh, and uh, go in that way. 
So thank you. Sorry thank for my English. Yes, I mean, we understand. English. Fine. No problem. No yeah. problem. Thank you very much for your contribution to, to the debate. Uh, Manel talked about dialogues between the European Union and various uh, institutions, uh, uh, let's say, and uh, Pakistan. Uh, I would like to raise one point with regard to what sort of dialogue. There was a question uh, last year by uh, MEP Fulvio Martuccello. That was addressed first to Valdis Dombrovskis, but uh, there was a second one, and I will focus on this one because I was a bit uh, uh, shocked by <laughs> the way <clears throat> it was presented. It was addressed to, uh, to Borel, Josep Borel. Uh, and uh, it was asking, okay, what are you doing exactly? The, the answer of Borel was, and I will, of course, make it, make it short. In December 2020, the EU delegation in Pakistan, together with the chairman of the Council of Islamic Ideology, organized a conference on interface and interface harmony. Okay. Uh, this initiative led to the adoption of a landmark joint declarations blah, blah, blah. A second interface and interface dialogue took place in Lahore in July uh, 2022. Uh, uh, then, of course, through the joint committee, the subgroups on human rights, political dialogue, strategic dialogue, the visit of Iman Gilmour uh, in Pakistan. Uh, but all this, it's just talking. It's just talking. Uh, words must be translated and converted into action and first i don't see any action and there is no transparency about the contents of those dialogues and mechanisms uh, and that's something that uh, the, the the members of the european parliament have complained uh, uh, about uh, as well and they totally ignore the existence of reports by ngos there is no reference to any report by CSW, by Human Rights Watch, by Amnesty International, and so on and so on. That sort of discourse I find everywhere. When the states are in the, in the dock, they say, oh, but we organized this, we organized that, uh, we, we sent a mission to blah, 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 blah. But what's the result? We have a new prime minister now, for, he's, been, he's been in his position for one year. Uh, it does not seem that the situation is improving. Well, that's, these are personal impressions that I really wanted to share with you at the end of this uh, uh, very uh, fruitful meeting and very informative meeting with uh, contributors from quite a number of uh, uh, a wide variety of uh, backgrounds. And I say, unfortunately, that I have to stop. It's uh, exactly one o'clock, and I want to be faithful to my promises to not go beyond uh, the two hours. Thank you very much. For <clears throat>